Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Gotta say, all in all, after waiting as long as we did for the Seattle Kraken to officially form as a franchise, waiting all that time for the name and logo to be revealed, all the hype about the expansion draft, everything like that, especially this expansion draft with so many weird, weirdly big names being exposed, a little underwhelming today, especially with the way the information rolled out. What's that Mickey Mouse meme where he's like jacked and then the other, the bad version is he's like heads crumpled in and like very deformed. That's (laughs) how I feel with Seattle. I came in thinking today that they could make a good run at the Pacific and now I'm just a, just a dead man. It just kind of bizarre the way things happened and it really didn't stop after it was done. So for context, we just got finished with the live stream, which means the actual expansion draft just ended. Um, and it was announced that prior to the expansion draft, no trades were made with the Kraken. I, so they, I honestly don't get it. Not to say that they can't trade any of the players that they just drafted. I mean, one, I wouldn't be surprised to see Giordano moved short term. They might wait still, but like those guys can be moved, but... There were some decisions there where we were saying, no, there has to be a side deal. There has to be a side deal. And according to the reporting right now, there weren't any. So weird, weird day overall. Um, This episode of the Wind Wheel podcast will be specifically regarding the expansion draft. Obviously, we're recording pretty late on Wednesday right right now. Wednesday right right now. Wednesday night right now. Friday is the uh, first round NHL draft live stream. Saturday is the Patreon exclusive rounds two through seven stream. And then Sunday is the draft recap episode. So lots to come. So we will be making sure that this episode is solely faced or um, solely about the expansion draft. If you haven't yet listened, um, the NHL draft preview episode is a mega episode that is meant to be a primer for Friday and Saturday's draft. So go listen to that if you haven't yet. But without further ado, welcome to the Winged Wheel podcast. I'm Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Brad, um, how dangerous would it be to give you a knife right now in general? On a scale of 1 to 10? Yeah. 12. <laughs> Probably best that with today wasn't the first day back in the studio, eh? <laughs> uh, I don't know if that would be for your sake or for my sake, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, with the year plus of us doing this remotely and a lot of pent up uh, stabbiness, probably best that we don't have a murder on day one. Would that hit the over or the under on what people would have predicted? Mm. <laughs> if they heard the episode, that would hit the over because they would assume it would have happened in pre recording and we wouldn't actually get an episode published. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the expansion draft, but first, um, as always, I do want to talk to you about the Jamie Daniels foundation. The more we talk about substance use disorder, the faster we can end the stigma and get support to those in need. The Jamie Daniels foundation is a children's foundation initiative, and it was established in memory of Jamie Daniels and founded by Jamie's father and Red Wings lead announcer, Ken Daniels and Jamie's mother, Lisa Daniels Goldman. The foundation strives to end the stigma of substance use disorder and provide support to those struggling with the disease or who are in recovery. To learn more and offer your support, visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org. Okay, before we get into the draft and the uh, who was selected from the Red Wings and, and the rest of Seattle's picks, let's talk a little bit about the way information came out today. Um, the way the NHL formulated the expansion draft day so to speak, is uh, having Seattle submit all of their picks by 10 a.m. Eastern to be announced 10 hours later. And it took all of, like, what, 30 minutes for the floodgates to start opening. Uh, Frank Saravalli was really the one uh, who had the biggest scoops early on, and then eventually everyone joined in once they realized the floodgates were open. And that was upsetting to a lot of people. I know a lot of people didn't want it spoiled. A lot of people were really bummed out. 
you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think in general, if you're on Twitter and just the nature of how sports reporting goes, you have to expect some leaks one way or another, but not really like this. But what I will say is I don't think it's fair to be angry at the reporters. I don't think anyone should be like, I thought the the memes were funny, but I don't think anyone should genuinely be slandering Frank Saravalli or, you know, Johnson or Friedman or, you know, whoever else is, is the local people, the local reporters who are leaking the picks. I don't think that's right. That's their job, right? That's what they're meant to do. That's what they're always going to do. If they don't do it, then they're not reporters. They're not insiders. They're not giving you the insight that they have. Why would they sit on that information? It's on the NHL to know that this is the way it's going to go and to formulate the announcement in a way where it is genuinely a surprise to everyone but the Kraken. Like, it's. I understand that there's some logistical hurdles. You want the players to know. You need to pre-record some announcements, blah, blah, blah. I get all that. But at the same time, like, think of how many fewer people tuned in today because the whole team, literally the whole team was spoiled hours beforehand. The last holdout was the Red Wings. And that was a mixture of Steve Eisman running a tight ship or like in all reality, the Seattle could, the Kraken couldn't contact Cholosky all day. Like 30 players we knew in advance. There was not one single surprise today. And I don't know. That's, that's just pretty crummy. Like that's Seattle's first real exposure on the national stage outside of their jersey and, and team name announcement. I don't know. I, I just wasn't a fan of that. It's not the reporter's fault. It's on the NHL. I don't know why you'd give 10 hours for this stuff to leak out. Like We don't do that with the draft. You mentioned that on the live stream, Evan. We don't do that with the draft. Why are we doing it with this? Let's well, just get all 32 teams. Well, 31 teams. Sorry, Phoenix. Just, uh, you know, noon on Friday. Just tell us who your first round picks are. And we'll just do it that way. And then the the tv show will be so everyone can get their picture taken walk up on stage and sign some shake some hands let's just do it like that you know may as well yeah, that was I, that I, was sarcasm by the way yeah <laughs> like think of how dull the draft would be if we did it that way and like i don't know what the point is here like the nhl is not going to have an expansion again for a long time if at all right like not unless there's a contraction i don't think we need more than 32 teams in the nhl but, yeah, it was just kind of a bummer. Yeah, is what it is. All right. the uh, Let's start with the Detroit Red Wings pick here. So the Seattle Kraken of all the players exposed, I think the major ones that were there were Stetcher, Cholosky, Nemesnikov, and Svechnikov. Um, we were pretty set on either Stetcher or I suggested Nemesnikov last episode. Um Cholosky was a little bit of a surprise today. So initial reactions, both from a Red Wings fan perspective and from a perspective of what Seattle's getting here. Well, Seattle bungled their damn near their entire team and almost half the picks they made, considering the context of there were no side deals made. Now, some guys are reporting that they're going to immediately flip some of these players in the coming days, but... From a value perspective, was this the best pick from Detroit from Seattle's perspective? No, I don't think so. Stetcher's a better player and probably would have got more futures. Um, does Chalosky feel a direct need based on the rest of the team that Seattle drafted? No, they. I think they had more left-handed defensemen drafted than any other position. So that seemed redundant. Uh, was... Like it's a bet on upside. That's all it is. Stetcher's twenty seven, we know what he is. Nemesnikov's in his late twenties as well, we know what he is. Svechnikov, I mean, he's went through waivers. So I, I don't think there was any real serious consideration given there. Um even though there probably should have been, but there there just wasn't. Ron Francis, I think, is the only other person on the face of the earth other than myself who still thinks there's a salvageable career in Dennis Cholosky, honestly. His development was stunted and so horribly managed in Detroit that primarily I'm happy for Dennis. He needed the hell out of this organization because they had done nothing right by him. Um, he's a guy who, if everything goes exactly right, which at this point is one hell of a long shot, but if everything goes exactly right, 
he could be uh, four or five defensemen who's capable of quarterbacking one of your power play units and doing so quite well. Is that going to happen? Well, I don't know, but Seattle's betting it's going to because that's the that was literally the only logical reason. We know they passed on a lot of other good players in the expansion draft because of contractual reasons, but all the best players who were available for Detroit all came dirt cheap. So there was no cap contract or cap implications coming out of Detroit. So it wasn't, it wasn't a cap decision. It was just they believe in the future of Dennis Chalosky. And they weren't too high on Stetcher and Nemesnikov. So, I I mean, it's definitely not the worst case scenario for Detroit. I think losing Stetcher was worst case scenario. Um, both from a player skill standpoint and an asset management standpoint. So, for two expansion drafts in a row, the Red Wings dodged an obvious bullet. Which is, hey, lucky. Um... Yeah, I a lot of what Seattle did confused me, but it is what it is. If if he pans out, we all look like idiots in Detroit, and if he if he doesn't, we lost nothing. Yeah, my initial reaction here is that I'm happy both from a Red Wings standpoint and from a Seattle Kraken standpoint. And that's not a slight on Dennis Cholosky. I just think of all the players available that were going to move the needle for the Red Wings in some kind of way, the one who I thought would be the most impactful was Stetcher. And that's not even a big move, but it's like you mentioned, Brad. He is better now and could garner more futures. I'm literally just thinking about trade potential here. But even then, I wouldn't have been terribly upset. I would have just been kind of bummed. Uh, I'm happy for Chalosky because, like you said, new start. I'm not a uh, a non-believer in Chalosky, but whatever his potential is, he wasn't figuring it out in Detroit. Is that 1,000% squarely on him? No, absolutely not. Is it more his, like, I think where I differ on you is, is, you know, recognizing the glaring holes in his defensive game. And I don't think you're not recognizing that, Brad. I just think you're... Your attribution to the development path is is a little bit more pronounced in your mind. And I, I don't know if I necessarily disagree with that part. It's just that at some point, it does fall on the player in my mind. So if Chelossi is to pan out, the time has come and gone for that to happen in Detroit. It just wasn't going to happen. And whether or not that's because of the player or whether that's because of what's been set up for him remains to be seen. Uh, Seattle will be another chance for him, provided they, they give him three quarters of a chance. That'll probably be more than what he had in Detroit. This is a guy who needs consistency. He needs confidence. And I would love to say he needs time, but I don't know. He's not old. He's 23. He's still a young kid, but at the same time, still, um, he's got to do more with his NHL reps than what we've seen, what we've seen. I don't think this affects the trajectory of the Red Wings. I think big picture it's disappointing to see a first round pick deflate and kind of fall flat like Chalosky did in the end. Um, I think we can argue until the sun goes down or the sun comes up, I should say, based on the time of night it is right now, uh, about why Chalosky didn't pan out. But at the end of the day, it just, I think we can agree, it just wasn't going to happen for him here. So is this best case scenario for the Red Wings? I mean, if. You ask a Cholosky optimist, no, that would have been Nemesnikov. But for me, I think anyone who wasn't Stetcher uh, is as good as you can hope for. And really, like we've said in past episodes, there was no version of events that happened today that was going to leave the Red Wings in a bad spot. The beauty of being a rebuilding team is that you suck through and through, so you do not have to worry about who gets taken. Yeah, I mean, I thought 100% sure Troy Stetcher was gone. Now that I've watched, painfully watched, the entire Seattle draft, I'm actually not surprised he's still on the Red Wings because I don't understand a lot of the picks they made. So from a Red Wings fan perspective, this really worked out pretty good. Um, I don't think Chalosky's going to move the needle. I mean, I don't think even Troy Stetcher is going to push the Red Wings up the standings either, but um, I like him a lot more than Chalosky, so... For Red Wings fans, I think it's to, to take one of Brad's sayings. It's it's fine. It's more pronounced than the F. It's fine. Fine. 
you got to hold it for as long as you think you can before you f- get away with sounding ridiculous. It's f- fine. There's oh, a the whole- negative percent chance Brad smiles or laughs today. <laughs> I know this dude is the grumpiest I have ever seen him. It's actually a little like I see a lot of pissed off people every day. I mean, Mel lives with me, so that's one thing. But it's it's kind of unsettling when you see Brad angry. Hey, eh? like that's like something is off with the Earth's balance. That is true. What was it, Brad? Your store closed at 7 and you still had a dozen people shopping in there at 7.15? Oh, most of them didn't leave till 7.30. But no, that was only one of the many things that added up today. So the Dennis Cholosky pick, uh, what does that do to the Red Wings blue line is the next question here. Because they have nothing by way of left defenseman. This actually justifies the Nicoletti trade a little bit more because they're going to have to go in and bring free agent left defenseman or, or do something here because uh, whether you're going to stick with Letty with Cider or Aronic, like your depth is down the right side. Lindstrom, they kept. They're probably going to play him. Stetcher, they kept. He plays the right side. Aronic plays the right side. Cider plays the right side. Like there's, you need people to play on the left side. So who are they going to bring in or how are they going to reshuffle this decor? My favorite part about this is when I said I didn't fully agree with the Red Wings protection list, I got a flood of I, the way people were in my comments. You'd, you'd think that Gustav Lindstrom is a shoe in for a Norris trophy down the road. He's not in the opening night lineup right now. Like unless they, they move someone to their offside and do not sign a free agent. Like, or and sorry, and they do sign a left-handed free agent. He's a healthy scratch night one. Your right side is Cider, uh, Stetcher, and Heronic. I think it's going to be the same thing as last year. We're going to see a couple of those depth signings: the Mark Stalls, the John Merrills, the Patrick Nemeth of the world. One or two guys like that, not big needle movers, good, reliable defensive guys. The Jeff Blashill type. They come cheap. Don't put up numbers. It's fine. They're they're gap fillers, which is exactly what this is now. Um, and I think they play along, like they plug in on that left side, and then you have one guy who's you know break glass in case of emergency. Um, I don't think it's going to be anything particularly exciting. I don't think it's going to be good. We were talking about it on the live stream. I have Ryan Murray circled as as my guy that probably best fits the bill out of who's available. If not, the next two best options might actually be John Merrill and Mark Stahl. So might see a reunion here, but yeah, it's, it doesn't affect much. Um, thank God we got Nick Letty now. Cause yeah, there is nobody else to quarterback a power play here. So that guy's going to play every minute of every power play the whole season until the trade deadline. Like I said, on the live stream, bring back Brendan Smith. He'll power, he'll, He'll quarterback the second power play unit. Yeah. <laughs> that once again was sarcasm. Yeah, I know. I realize. I think it's just because it's it's been a long night. And anytime we record post live stream, a lot of the uh, cadence in our voice is missing. So maybe people don't always get the sarcasm right away. So it's probably good that you're qualifying that. Um, something I want to clarify earlier before we talk about the rest of Seattle's picks. We mentioned that it was reported that there were no side deals or no trades that happened. That was trade specific to prior to the expansion draft. So that, that the deal was, you know, Team X paid Seattle this pick or this player to not select this player or to select specifically this other crappy player. That's just one kind of trade. There is another kind of trade that is currently under an embargo of sorts um, and can be announced as of 1 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. So that'll be Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And that's trades that happen after they've picked the players. So Seattle takes Giordano and they trade that they trade him to New York for Strom or whatever the trade is. Who knows? Uh, apparently those are in the hopper right now. So by the time you're listening to this, those may have transpired. So uh, take a lot of this episode with a big grain of salt because those may have come about. So, you know, we talked about this really for the last year and a half to two years, the situation that the Red Wings were going to be in, it just wasn't going to be earth shattering. It was not going to change the course of this team. All we pretty much learned today was that 
Dennis Cholosky didn't really fit into Eisenman's vision for the future of this team. He was left exposed and he was taken. So um, I think the best that we can do right now is wish the best for Cholosky in Seattle. Hope he gets a, a fresh start and a better chance there. And understand that this is at worst a bad day for Cholosky fans. But at best, and I think this is a reality for a lot of Red Wings fans, it's a eh, never is good to lose an asset for nothing, but it's much better situation than the rest of the league is in. Any parting comments on the Cholosky pick before we move on to the rest of the league here? All right. Oh, I thought it was hilarious that an octopus announced the Cholosky pick. I thought that was the funniest thing, this draft. That was the only redeeming quality of the entire broadcast. That was 90 minutes of just, I don't even want to call it awful. It was just boring. Nothing happened. Ah, uh, I see. You've now attended another NHL event. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they should have got someone like creed or nickelback to play oh man you have no idea how much i would unironically love that well nickelback's from canada so they know hockey so they were way too qualified to uh announce some of these picks because their their theme was let's get like a couple former hockey players and then like 12 people who have never watched a game to make the announcements brad i'll pay you money to sing nickelback covers of like hockey like a remixes and make it like hockey related no all right sorry you hate money okay um the rest of the league so again seattle may have trades in the hopper here that we won't know about or they might continue to make these trades now that the expansion draft has happened um but a lot of their picks were kind of strange I mean, let's talk about the big ones. The carry price pick didn't come through, quite obviously. They chose not to take on carry Price's god-awful contract. And that's something that I know we agree with. But apparently they were considering strongly. And to me, that was, I don't know, that was a far departure from the team that we saw today. After seeing the rest of their team, no, they weren't. They absolutely were not. They were That was a bluff to get Montreal going. They avoided cap hits. Like Wesley Snipes avoid pay, avoids paying his taxes. They just were not taking any unreasonable contract at all. Why is that the reference you made? It was money. It was on my mind. But um, there was like, if they stomached a few bad contracts, then I would be, like for good players, like hypothetically a James Van Riemsdyk go to Philly or a Tarasenko go to St. Louis. I would have put a little more credence to the fact they were actually considering Carey Price. No, they absolutely were not. Never in a million years. They literally crossed the minimum uh, in terms of salary for what they had to take on by like a million and a half dollars. They were... Ron Francis wasn't lying when he said cap space is his biggest asset and he went nuclear to maximize that. All, all, he almost went too far on it, truthfully. Um, but yeah, so... I think they were just trying to bluff out Montreal to see what they could get out of it. They landed at 52 and a half million in the end. So I think on the broadcast, I said 49, but they did land at 52. Ron Francis actually went on the record with Greg Wyshynski from ESPN and said like teams weren't willing to make the mistakes they made last time. So wasn't really able to draft leverage the draft rules the same way Vegas did. Maybe he should have lowered his prices, honestly, but still. yeah, because the ask for out of, the ask of Montreal to not take Jake Allen before the list went in was a first and a third round pick, which is insane. Of course, nobody's going to pay that. So Ron Francis, from the sounds of it, priced himself right out of the Vegas formula. So he, he asked high, was unwavering, and ended up with nothing, and then completely botched the draft following. Didn't Ron Francis not make any trades when he was a GM as well? He, he oh, was a very yeah. bland GM that drafted very well. That, that, like when you look at Carolina and the success they have from him, it was it was all draft. He didn't make a ton of huge or significant moves outside of that to boost the team. They just drafted very well. So knowing that. Yeah, and he also stated, 
my friend is speaking right now. He he stated that the contract was the difference in the end for Carey Price. Something I said on the the broadcast or the live stream, I should say, they had two options here, Seattle. Maximize cap space and suck or go balls to the wall like Vegas did and try to trick teams into giving them more than they needed to. And I think they would have happily taken the latter because being competitive sooner is better for the team. But if teams were unwilling to make the same mistakes they did last time, then you know what? You don't want to half-ass it and end up as a middling team. Uh, miss your chance at the next two draft lotteries in which there are possibly three generational talents across both drafts. It's boring. Today was kind of a flop. But in terms of running a hockey team... I can't say I disagree with the overall concept. There's individual players where I will say I have God knows no idea why they took this player considering who else was available just for the sake of flipping them for more assets later, but also knowing that the league isn't very active right now in taking on players and contracts like with the flat cap, not there's not a lot of movement. So philosophically, I get it, um, but it still was a little bit of a weird day. So Go ahead, Brad. I can count at least five picks that make no sense. And I'm not talking picks I disagree with. Picks that I can't actually comprehend what they were thinking. Like, I know Evan got all rattled on the live stream when they took Morgan Geeky out of Carolina instead of Jake Bean, the obvious pick, or even Nino Niederreiter. But I understand the appeal to Morgan Geeky. I, I get it. Again, was that the pick I would make? No, but I, but I get it. I'm not counting those type of picks in the five where there was a more obvious pick and it was just like Curtis McDermott out of LA, Alex True out of San Jose, Gavin Bayreuther, a, a terrible defenseman who's a pending UFA out of Columbus, Carter Torinsky out of Philly, Brandon Tanev out of Pittsburgh, and that they avoid contracts like the plague, but take that one. I don't get it. It just, I don't know what they were doing. Like those don't make any sense from whatever perspective you want to make. Again, philosophically, you're right. I get what they were trying to do. I don't disagree with it. Oh, I forgot John Quenville out of Chicago. And I get it. They just, they went too far. Like they went too aggressive to this preserving cap space when they could have got better players, albeit at a bigger contract, but short term that they could have then flipped at the deadline. Like you take a Vladimir Tarasenko hypothetically, like I know I'm using one of the best examples. He's got two years left at seven and a half million. You don't want to get stuck to seven and a half million. And I get that. You play him for the first half of the year and you rehab him. And if you, you give him 37 power play minutes a night, if he pops off, you can move him with a year and a half left, probably at full contract pop and get a hell of a return for futures and thus getting the cap off your books. The risk there is you get stuck with him for two years. Only two years. Like, those are the opportunities they miss. I know St. Louis, that's not the best example because they took Vince Dunn, who is a perfectly acceptable replacement, but not taking Max Domi out of Columbus, not taking James Van Riemsdyk out of Philly. It just, it left so much, they left so much value on the board. It just, like I said, yeah. they, I get what they were trying to do, but they galaxy brained it. Yeah, Bayreuther over Domi and Stenland, like Geeky over Bean. I mean, you advocated for Geeky, and I think that's fair, but I don't know. With Jake Bean. Uh, Torinsky over the, the like JVR, Ghost. Depends on what you think about Voracek. Are you right? I think the Galaxy brand it. I, th I think maybe they were there's some mix of preserving cap space and tanking here and – the the tank plus cap space is a strategy to me, but yeah, I don't know how this is going to pay off for them because there's a lot of building left to do after this. It's, you know, uh, Ron Francis is, is here saying even tomorrow, there are probably going to be fewer trades than people think. You have a lot of time to move these guys if you select them. And if you care about cap space so much, you have a ton. You don't have to select. You're not selecting Carey Price, but if you take Tarasenko and keep him, even if he doesn't rebound in the, in the biggest way, but he's serviceable, 
retain some salary, right? Like you can probably turn that into a first. You know, Tarasenko also, besides the Vince Dunn thing, maybe not the best example because you don't know what his shoulder injury is going to be, but still like a little weird. It's not perfect, but, and it wasn't with Vegas and they got a lot of criticism, but yeah, just operationally, I just don't get a lot of it. Yeah, the other one that I don't get either. I mean, I agree with all the ones you guys have said so far, and that was the top of my list for the one the head scratchers. The other one that I didn't really get was the the Curtis McDermott pick. Like, I think he's Brad. Would you say he's the lowest in expected goals for in the NHL? Yeah, by expected goals for percentage or expected goals percentage. He was like, the worst player in the NHL last year. Like I, I just don't understand that pick when you could get someone like a Brendan Lemieux who's only making $1.5 million, and that's an easy target at the trade deadline for a team to pick up to solidify some depth and fill in some injuries. Like, they could have had Athens see you out of LA. They could have had Athens see you. But... <laughs> yeah, like it's the list of picks you guys had plus that, it's just... I don't really understand the strategy in which they're going for because they're just basically taking bad players who don't make a lot of money. Like, if you're just <clears throat> going to sit at the cap floor, I mean, you could have had better players who are also cheap who you could potentially flip for anything. Like, maybe some, like a third round draft pick for some players. It's better than what you've picked with some of these head scratchers. And, and the thing is, too, because. It's funny how the narrative keeps changing in the general public to make it make sense, and then it immediately gets disproven. We saw the leaks in the roster today, and we're like, oh, yeah, this just screams that there was a lot of trades like Columbus is giving them, hey, we'll give you a second-round pick. Please take Bayreuther and leave Domi alone. Okay. And then the news comes out. No, there was zero of those trades. And it's like, okay, well, they picked a couple guys that they can probably flip tomorrow. So that's kind of the narrative now. Like, yeah, they drafted Mark Giordano, but they're going to trade him tomorrow and, and get like a whole bunch of futures for him. But they are so close to the cap floor, they can't shed too many players for picks because then they won't be at the cap floor. So they can only jettison so much money from the players that they acquired or else they don't meet the requirements. So then the next theory is, well, they're just going to be really aggressive in free agency, which for a team that's very cap conscious is the absolute worst thing to do. So I don't think that's their strategy. So I think this literally is going to be pretty damn close to what their team is actually going to look like. I'm sure we'll see a couple guys flipped. Like, I, I was reading on Twitter, there's apparently already a deal in place with someone for Tyler Pitt. Like, whoop de doo um, But yeah, they really did handcuff themselves based on the fact that they asked too high. Now they didn't take enough salary to the point where they can move out a lot of salary without taking more contracts back. Like, again, philosophically, I get it. But in practice, this is a disaster. <laughs> I don't want to call it a disaster. I want to see what trades happen. And also, I think it's important to say, if we were sitting here and Ron Francis was a guest on this show today, he would say, you're looking at this as a you know gambit between this player and that player when it should be against this immediate group of, you know, eighth best players on the team or however you want to qualify the, first, the best unprotected player uh, versus the cap space we can get. And what they are essentially betting is that the cap space and flexibility that they have now, ignoring, you know, specific player decisions, is going to be more important down the road. And I also want to say, I don't think every pick was terrible. I mean, they walked away with Yanni Gord. I thought Vince Dunn was good. Like, there's, it's not like they were bad across the board. I don't even think the Dennis Cholosky pick was bad. Not that that's, you know, terribly impactful. Susie from Minnesota, I don't think was bad. You know, a lot of people wanted Kakinen. Uh, Yarn Croc from Nashville was good. Appleton from Winnipeg, was it DeMello? No, but I think Appleton was also a good pick. Like there's there's enough there where I'm not going to say this is a trash team and they just ruined the outlook of the organization for the next X years. No, they are just going balls to the wall with cap space is our asset. So 
partially like I, I'm not discrediting anything that we've talked about, but I'm just partially reserving judgment until I see what they flip these trades into. And I really think that their team is going to be built not through this draft, but the, not through this expansion draft, but the next two NHL drafts. As, as I said earlier, I don't. I, I believe Ron Francis when he says there's not that much coming through the hopper because he can't have that much coming through the hopper. Like I said, there's going to be a couple trades tomorrow, but it's none of those trades are going to improve this team now. Which again, this this doesn't feel like that's what they want anyway. Which is fair. They probably look at Shane Wright and Connor Bedard and go, yes. Um, but again, even from that standpoint, there was. What it ultimately comes down to me is that there was just too much value left on the table. They could have got a ton of futures. I get that you get value with cap space. Don't get me wrong. Steve eisenman has been trying to weaponize his cap space very publicly for a year and a half now. What has he got out of that cap space? A second and a fourth round pick. I don't think Seattle is getting... All that much futures from, quote unquote, weaponizing their cap space. They will. They'll get some. Don't get me wrong. But in these types of trades, it's a race to the bottom, not to the top. If if Steve Eisenman's sitting there right now going, you know what? I could take Tyler Johnson's contract from Tampa, but all they're offering me is a second round pick. Seattle's not going to come in and get a first round pick to do it. They'd have they'd get a third round pick to do it. Like it's it's a race to the bottom weaponizing cap space. So again, I get it. I just don't think it's going to work like they think it's going to work. Now, if their plan is to be real bad for 3 to 5 years, accrue a ton of draft picks, a lot of top 5 picks, yeah, sure. That's fine. And I won't even disagree with it. If that is plainly what they are doing, but We'll see. This was overall pretty underwhelming from an interesting and entertainment standpoint. Oh, interest and entertainment fell flat for 10 different factors today. Thank goodness for that octopus. I think that octopus's name is Licorice. So thank you, Licorice, for saving the day. Um, but yeah, I, I think ignoring the player, like the specific player selections, if they were going the inverse of the Vegas route, uh, and just basically sucking, like pre-tanking, it was always going to suck. So, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, Brad. Okay, uh, let's do some predictions here before jumping into overtime. Knowing that the Pacific blows, Anaheim, Calgary, Edmonton, LA, San Jose, Seattle, Vancouver, and Vegas, is this a playoff team as is right now? Or even in your head, make some rough guesses on trades. Does this team make the playoffs or sniff the playoffs, or are they a bottom feeder? I think they're a fringe. This division really sucks. They are going to have a very strong defense. Um, that was that was a theme. They passed over a lot of good players to pick up defensemen. Um, so when you look at the pairings they can create, I, I think there's something there. This team is going to struggle to score goals. Um, they're built a lot like the Montreal Canadiens now that I think about it, but without Carey Price. I don't have faith in their goaltending. I think it could be good. Uh, obviously, Drieger just came off a great season. Um, Vanacek and Decord aren't great fallbacks if it goes sideways for him. Um, but if it goes well for him, then good. So, yeah, I, I I think I still like them better than, you know, Arizona and San Jose and a couple other teams in the division. But I don't think they're going to be at the Vegas Edmonton level, even though I think Ken Holland's going to drive Edmonton into the ground in three years, they're not there yet. Um, they're still going to be good this year. So, yeah, somewhere between three and five in that division is probably my guess. Someone's got to score goals for them, and I don't know who the heck that's going to be right now. So, for me, I don't think they make the playoffs in their inaugural season. <sighs> I think they're going to finish around five, maybe six in the division. Um, it's tough to me. I don't, I think they'll miss. I think they'll miss, but I think there's a chance. Like, I, I think fringe is right, Brad. It's pretty much a coin toss in my mind, whether they make it or not. I view them as, I, I think they'll surprise. I think they'll be better than people think. Um, there's also the factor here where players with bigger opportunities seem to do more, or at least they have an opportunity to do that. 
Um, I probably pegged them as around a 90 point team plus or minus, you know, I don't know. I'll cheat here and say five to 10. <laughs> like that's quite a big range, but I don't, they wouldn't be a hundred point team. I, I would put them anywhere between 85 and 95 in my mind. And that could be a playoff team. So I agree. I think they will be fringe. Uh, Ron Francis loves his defense. And like you both mentioned, like this is a team that's very well constructed from the back end and, and that'll help them quite a bit. I'm a big believer in the Drieger Vanacek goalie tandem. I know we talked on the, the live stream, Brad, do you think that might, that has a chance of failing? And I agree there's risk there, but I, I think, they can ride the hot hand and do well there. Who's going to score goals? They're going to have to rely a lot on, on Everly, a lot on Gord. Jared McCann with a, is going to have a bigger role, and and who knows how he'll he'll expand. Um, yeah, I think they're going to be a fringe team. I think honestly, worst case scenario is Seattle barely makes the playoffs here, <laughs> like and misses out on the draft lottery because I don't know that they're doing very much when they get there. But who knows what the the, the con- the construction of this roster is going to be then. So um, mildly related, their jerseys are unreal and their home jerseys are absolutely incredible. Holy shit. Those look so good. Like and with people actually wearing them, my God. Yeah, that's a top 10 Jersey in the league. Absolutely. Yeah. Total number of points. I'm going to make you guys do it because I did it. I'll I'll go I'll go 88 points. What do you guys think they land with? 91. I'll say 85. Okay. I'll, I'll we're all within more or less the same range. All right. Um, okay, let's let's jump into overtime here. Before actually I do that, again, just a quick reminder. Uh the NHL draft preview episode is out right now. Uh Give that a listen. It is a primer for the draft. Friday on YouTube, we are going to be live streaming the first round of the draft, same way we did today where we where you watch along with us. Analysis, reactions, we'll give away prizes. Um, Evan's going to sing for you the, the whole nine yards. Uh, and then on Saturday will be the Patreon exclusive live stream um, or the Patreon exclusive. It's more of like a, a um, hangout where other people can get on the call and talk and stuff. It's a good time. Um, also, uh, patrons, we're giving away a signed Henrik Zetterberg stick to a lucky patron after the draft is our way of saying thank you. Surprise, we've been excited to give away. Don't let the cadence of my voice fool you. We actually are pretty excited, just um, tired. So uh, thank you all for sticking with us through the expansion draft. Let's jump into overtime and take some questions from our lovely, lovely uh, Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash podcast if you want to support the show. Aaron Hudson says, uh, I think for, uh, I for one think Steve Eisman should get a prize for keeping Seattle's pick secret, uh, longer than all the other GMs. First overall pick in 2022 is a prize worthy of his ability to stay quiet. I mean, I tend to agree. Wouldn't be bad. Uh, Jonathan Melwish says, uh, biggest heart memorial trophy snub since 2000. What is your opinion for me? It's Jerome McGinley in 0102. Iggy in 0102 is, I think, an excellent answer there. That was a rough. That's the obvious answer. So I'll give another one just for the sake of it. I still don't think Taylor Hall deserved it over Nathan McKinnon. Never I that one never that. sat right with me. Yeah, I can see that. I, I I actually completely understand that one, especially more now in retrospect. Uh Josh Terrell. Oh, this is the best idea I've heard for the draft so far. How great would it be if the NHL still forced the Coyotes to go up to the podium and announce that they are drafting nobody? Incredible. We've been we've been bad boys, so we don't get a pick. Thank you. Uh, Shea Weber's crying BJ says, with the reports of LA potentially shop. Oh God, that name. The ports of LA potentially shopping the eighth overall pick. What are the chances of Eisman making a trade for it? If so, then what number does Jesper Wallstedt wear? Um, what does LA want to trade to move up two spots is the question. There are a lot of good options for, to trade back. It's just that some of them aren't worth the cost, right? Like teams aren't going to give up an additional first to move up two spots. Unless you mean for Detroit to move up to the eighth overall pick, in which case I, I give up pick 23. Would you give up pick 23 and 38 for pick eight? To move up to eight? Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, thousand percent. Yes, my God, are you kidding me? Sorry, uh, twenty-three, thirty-eight, and forty-eight. Yes. Uh, now we're getting away from it, but pr- probably still. Like, I don't think that's enough for LA. You guys are right. Yeah, like honestly, because you're probably giving up one of Hughes, Edmondson, Kent Johnson, Wallstead, if you so please. For don't get me wrong, there's a lot of guys in the late first, second round I like, but those are guys I like is like middle six, like middle pair options, not. You know, I think Ken Johnson is the most likely guy to drop to nine. So if he's there at eight, you could get a guy who quarterbacks your power play for the next 10 years in exchange for a bunch of middle pair guys. Yeah, I'd do that in a heartbeat. Uh, Colorado 14 ers says, calling my shot. Eklund to Buffalo first, Wallstedt to Seattle second, Power to Anaheim at third, Clark to New Jersey at fourth, Beneers to Columbus number five. Hughes to Hughes to Detroit at six, McTavish to San Jose at seven, Genther to LA at eight, and Johnson to Vancouver at nine was Fetchkoff going to Ottawa at 10th. Not what I think should happen, but what I think will. Uh, Nick Geyer says, now that you've read my name, uh, have you read it correctly? Last overtime, you said Nick Geyer. I know. So Nick, I actually know people whose last names are spelled like yours and they pronounce it Geyer, which is sometimes I say Geyer. And I no, it's Geyer, and I think I've said Geyer the first couple of times, and you know, if you've been listening long enough, you'll know that I'm an idiot with names. Um, now we have beef. <laughs> so will we all be copying a crack in Jersey? I think they're pretty schmexy. Yeah, I wouldn't hate a Dennis Cholosky home Seattle crack in Jersey. That would actually be pretty sweet. Um, Ryan Lipsdorf says, in a theoretical non-player expansion draft, protect the following from the wings. Two front office, one coach. One announcer, broadcaster, or PR. Oh wow. Um, Steve Eisman. The troubling part for me is: do we have to do we protect Ken or Mick? Oh, I don't want to pick. I don't want to pick. Uh, I can distract you guys and deliver some. Breaking news, if we want to break it in the middle of overtime. Yeah, let's do it. Dreger Dreger reporting Taylor Hall is very close to finalizing a four-year, $24 million contract with Boston. That's great value for Boston. That's an incredible deal. Wow, Taylor Hall's stock has fallen like a... Like, $6 million is nothing to scoff at, but this is a guy who was looking for nine plus before. Imagine what he turned down before the pandemic. We... Okay. I just want this on record now. If Taylor Hall signs for $6 million a year and only for four years, which basically takes him through whatever even close to prime he has left in his career, and Ken Holland gives Zach Hyman eight years at anything over $5 million, nothing in this league is justifiable anymore. Nothing. Um, Eisman Draper, uh, Coach Tongue just because he just got there, and for the announcer broadcaster, I'll protect Ken because I don't think they'll take Mick. I think they'll know his heart's in Detroit, and they won't want to. It won't fit anywhere else. It's like the old uh, Jason Spezza when he got waived. He's like, I won't. I'm not coming if you sign if you take me, and yeah. he just stayed in Toronto. <laughs> That'll be the approach we'll take. Um, Cody Stark says, "Can't believe the rumor that Holland is not only re-signing Mike Smith, but for multiple years." If he was losing his marbles five years ago, then I'd have to say he's just completely nuts. We've used multiple multiple videos of Mike Smith during goalie camps to show kids what not to do. Has Kenny forgot about the goals he let in against the Jets in the playoffs? Good God, man. Yeah, I – between the Hyman thing that Brad just said, because apparently there's a rumor of a sign-in trade between Toronto so they can get Hyman at eight years and then deliver him to Edmonton, and this Mike Smith multiple-year re-signing, I just don't get him. I just don't get him. Steve Eisman says a quick poem. You'll never know and I'll never tell. If you leak to reporters, I'll send you straight to hell. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, longtime lurker says uh, bunker birdie, baby birdie. Now each of you say that 10 times fast as possible. Glad to finally be here, gents. Keep up the average work and Stevie we trust. Bunker birdie, baby birdie, bunker birdie, baby birdie, bunker birdie, baby birdie. Am I saying anything dirty when I say that? Because sometimes they trick me. I don't think so. I don't hear anything dirty, but I'm not trying it. 
Um, Baya says, hey, boys, for our first round picks, would you rather have Wallstedt and Stankovin or Eklund and Kosa? Glad I found this podcast. Love you guys. Dutch slash Malaysian Red Wing tuning in. Wow. Thank you for the support. And uh, very cool to have support from around the world. Eklund and Kosa, and it's not even close in my mind. Yeah, I'm also going Eklund. I would agree with that. Uh, Mr. Socks says, Hey boys, been listening for a while now and finally decided to chip, chip in. Thank you, Mr. Sock or my socks, Mr. Socks. <laughs> I'm, I'm working with a third of my brain at this point. It should be Mr. Socks. Mr. Your name is now Mr. Socks. I think all of my energy right now is devoted to not being grumpy because I'm used to being grumpy and Brad's happy. And when he comes into a podcast pissed off, I can't also be pissed off. You're throwing me off, Brad. Um, thank you for so much for the support. Um, I'm working at a golf course this summer and I thoroughly enjoy listening to you. You guys want to out cutting the grass. Oh man, Evan, you have a friend question is considering they're still on the board. How much do you think the U of M factor will weigh in for the wings at pick six? Uh, <laughs> there's a good chance. None of them are available for the red wings. If Ken Johnson goes before, uh, veneers and power will definitely be gone. So, I don't think it'll factor in that much, truthfully. Uh, more I think about it, I don't think it'll factor in at all. I think the way it factors in is it gives the Red Wings more familiarity with the players, right? Like, that's right next door. It's just down the road in Ann Arbor. So they know those players. They'll have scouted them for as long as they've been at Michigan. And I think there is an implicit amount of you know, these are professional scouts. This is the point of like, this is their job. So they know how to get rid of the biases. They know how to get rid of confirmation or exposure bias. But to some degree, if there's a hidden gem or if there's more to that player than is apparent, you know, for Kent Johnson, if they can look at him and say, yeah, people might think he's a risk, but we're reasonably confident he'll pan out. That's where you find the influence. Uh, <laughs> Steve Eisenman's extremely tight lips. <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> Steve is having such a good offseason. He ended the Cholosky discourse. That's truly a blessing because Brad actually would have killed me one day. And I need you guys to know. I need everyone to know that I, I'm sure I'll die at the hands of someone else one day, but all of my money is on, is on it being Evan and not Brad. And if I die at the hands of Brad, I will be thoroughly upset. Uh, he gave the Red Wings their first NHL caliber defenseman in almost five years at the cost of your 35, 35th ranked forward and created an artificial market for Zach Hyman. So his former idiot boss would have to pay seven plus million for a half point, a game player, which should expedite the event, the inevitable McDavid trade. Truly a beautiful mind. Also, if you guys didn't see, uh, Seattle made zero trades before the expansion. So they, they can still flip those players after, but yes, completely agree. Um, as good as it gets says, Hey guys, thanks as always for the pod. Do you think you will ever become crazy like dangle and move to three pods a week regularly? Uh, we'd have to, things would have to change drastically. Like all three of us would have to be working in hockey full time for that to be a thing. So never say never, but as we are right now, I think we're more focused on two good episodes a week and the content around it on YouTube, online, etc. Um, but who knows? Continue to support on Patreon. Jake Kiefer says, just bought uh, glass season tickets for the Griffins this season. Want to gather suggestions for a game day jersey to buy. My initial thought is Cider or Raymond should he play in Grand Rapids. Oh, if you can get a Raymond game worn or game day jersey, definitely. Cider won't hurt either, but I'm not sure how much he'll be playing Grand Rapids this year. Um, oh, I love this account. Hey, Evan. Hey, Evan, you wake up in the year 3000. What is your first Google search? I have no idea. This is a terrible question to ask way past my bedtime. <laughs> um, honestly, ask that question again on whenever the next time we record is Sunday. Ask it then. I have no idea off the top of my head. Uh, I would be like a summary of the last thousand years for me. I wouldn't read it. I would need a video synopsis. Yeah, I'm sure there'd be a video synopsis. Or how did uh, the Earth survive the climate crisis for the next thousand years? 
Um, Jake Nagy says, just saw an interview where Stevie mentioned checking his scouts rankings versus what Bob McKenzie has listed to see if they are ranking guys properly. Does it surprise you that even he gives a shit what anyone else thinks about prospects? No, I think that's prudent, right? Like, first of all, Eisenman isn't an amateur scout. He'll be in on the first pick and he'll be in on every pick, but he generally trusts his guys. Secondly, Bob McKenzie's list is extremely important in terms of making sure you have a good pulse as to what the rest of the league is thinking. So it's really just intel on other teams. Uh, Mike Hernelstein says, the only jersey I've purchased in my adult life was Dennis Cholosky after his incredible first 10 games. Now what? Franz Nielsen. Uh, Buy a Brad Crisco jersey. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Bananas Larger says, it seem, hey guys, it seems like every time I see a new Oilers rumor, I get sad for McDavid. So let's trade him for a conditional first. The condition being you can have a first round pick each year. He's a Red Wing. Um, Would you make that trade? Yes, a thousand percent. My God, yes. So you would trade eight years of first round picks to have McDavid? The greatest player of our generation? All right. Yes. If you have McDavid also, let's... Not forget, there's a good chance those picks are in the 20s. Yeah, so... That, that doesn't mean we can't tr- find another first-round pick somewhere. Like, trade a piece or something. I just wanted to wake you up, Brad. Uh, Matt S. says, Hey, guys, sad to see Chalosky go, but would have rather seen Nemestikov. Uh, would have rather seen Nemestikov, but I understand Seattle getting him since I think he still has time to change his trajectory around. I wish him the best out west. He's also closer to home. That's something we failed to mention from out in BC. Um, I'll be at the Wings draft party at LCA on Friday, hoping they draft Wallstead at 6 and Mason McTavish or Fedor Svechkov at 23. Keep up the good work as always, Dub Dubs. I still keep forgetting to cancel my gym membership so I can become a name level patron. <laughs> well, I think your gym membership might be a little bit more important, but uh, hey, uh, if you want to get fat with us, it'll benefit us both and hurt us both. Uh, Lars, the prophet of the towering behemoth, says, Hey guys, there has to be a million side deals that the Kraken has going because they picked way too many corpses. Mm, fortunately not speaking of corpses what the hell is ken holland doing trying to improve their alumni team keith smith and hyman will spend more time in triage than on the ice during their contacts yeah man it's weird um vax wax and what the hell is ron francis smoking says hey fellows i have so many questions about the draft and i don't understand what seattle's doing even though this reeks of side deals, those trade rumors are non-existent. There's nothing being floated. I don't know how they walk out of, how they walk out of today without Kevin Stenland, Aston Reese, Grundis, uh, Grundestrom, Christian Fisher, James Van Riemsdyk, Ryan Donato, and a whole slew of others. I don't know. This is totally sus. I spent so much time watching them put together shit team. And while we're at it, Ferk Pierre, Ozzy Hall of Fame, stay fresh cheese bags. Um, Jethro E says, so can we all agree that Ron Francis is not on the same level as Steve Eisman? Holy cow, this expansion draft moved me from being hyped to see, uh, how the Kraken would look to being barely whelmed. Also a reminder to our friends in Edmonton, the trade was one for one. Uh, Matthew Tangsrud, Tangsrud says, Hey guys, uh, I was disappointed that Cholosky was picked by Seattle, but I was happy Stetcher wasn't taken. I agree with Brad's that the Wings mishandled Chalosky's development and a fresh start in Seattle will be good. Now looking forward to the draft on Friday. Should the Wings take Bowen Byram if he hasn't picked before pick six? Should we take Nico Dawes? What's this year's draft draft joke? I don't know, Evan. Who uh, who are the Red Wings double drafting this year? Um, You haven't messed up in any of our mock drafts. I know. That's why I'm struggling to come up with a name because there hasn't been anyone even close. Yeah. I miss when you didn't pay attention. Um, Anyone cooking something fun for the draft? I'll be smoking a brisket for Friday evening. Looking forward to watching the draft with you guys. And as always, stay fresh cheese bags. I will just be happy if I have time to eat dinner before the draft this time. We should get you a feeding tube. Could have used it today. Uh, Doc Tia says, finally uh, decided to get more involved in the pod. It's been fun to listen to your banter and insight for the past couple of years and look forward to seeing the team improve and hopefully the community surrounding the podcast follows that as well. Thank you, Doc Tia, for so much for your support. We really appreciate you saying that. Uh, highlight of the live stream was Tanda's ridiculous profile pic and the Seattle doctor jerking off the invisible man. Cheers till next time. <laughs> 
Oh, he's man. very passionate. I will say that. And uh, uh, Gary Bettman calling climate pledge arena climate change arena. <laughs> well, if that's what's causing climate change, let's just tear the arena down. The most NHL thing ever is the only entertaining things about the broadcast is when they were unintentionally funny. Oh, uh, man. Uh, good day, Dead Duds. It is I, Troy Stetcher, back for another season after spinning away from the clutches of Ron Francis. How long did BJ rant for about the Wings screwing up Chalowski's development? I bet between 4.20 minutes and 6.9 minutes. Anyways, counterpoint, Eisenman on multiple occasions challenged Chalowski to be more assertive, and he just hasn't. At some point, it's on the player, and before you chime in, BJ, about Blashill, I maintain Blashill as Eisenman's puppet, and most of these personnel moves come from him. You get no rebuttal either, and you had your chance earlier in the episode. For what it's worth, there's still the possibility he does develop into the player uh, BJ thinks he can be, but I'm not convinced it's going to happen. Jersey time. Seattle home versus Vegas home and Seattle away versus Vegas away. Pick some winners. This week's critical thinking has been brought to you by Stay Fresh Cheese Bags of Fournier Company. Oof. So let's go Seattle home versus Vegas home first. Sorry, I wasn't listening. We're talking jerseys. Yeah. Yeah. Seattle home versus Vegas home. I'm going to go Seattle. That's too hard. You see how the edge here too. That's a crazy tough call because I think Vegas' home is gorgeous, but I'm going to give Seattle the edge here. Yeah, I think I think Seattle too, but then I'm Vegas away. I'm also Vegas away. Yeah, I think Vegas' whites are much cleaner than Seattle's. I'll make it three for three. Seattle home, Vegas away. I think overall Vegas still has a better set. They're oh man. Man. I, Vegas really nailed their gear, which does make a difference in overall uniform because I want to see what Seattle's full getup looks like because they have interesting possibilities with like when you, when you get down to the details like pant stripes and the gloves and stuff like that because Vegas nailed the white gloves on their way and yeah. I don't know if Seattle's going to do anything that crazy, but I'm going to reserve my overall until i actually see them on the ice but it'll be tough to top vegas all right everyone we're gonna wrap up this episode of the wing wheel podcast tune in on friday for the nhl draft uh live stream uh subscribe on youtube if you haven't already for that uh listen to our uh nhl draft preview episode it's a monster episode about two hours uh, of great great draft priming content so make sure you listen to that of course thank you for listening to thank you for listening to this episode thank you to all of our incredible patrons um again we're very excited to give away that um henrik signed henrik zetterberg stick uh additionally we're going to have more giveaways uh, at large we'd like to thank our name level sponsors of the wind wheel podcast on patreon arjun shanker eves bartels on behalf of the sarah grand foundation brett bailey king tone terry driver of cry and ryan hannah banana slam and jamathong taylor tagel brandon m citizen high five Craig Kibble, Greech, Hana Lee, Hassam al Kassem, Jacob Turner, Jake Kiefer, Jeremiah Dobo, Joe Santangelo, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kaylin Wood, Cody Stark, Kyle Hashman, Kyle McClure, Matt McKay, Matthew M. Rice, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Stacey Lynn, Zach Spring, Andrew Bohan, Sam Bankson, Adam, I wish I could finish like Ernie, another former junior goalie turned golfer, Antonio Gracias, Colorado 14ers, Connor Leighton, currently out of name ideas, Dave W., Evans Bingo Card, Jeremy Brocker, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Matt Keeler. Most secrets make for excellent blackmail material. Words to live by for a resident man, a few words, Evan, XOXO, Gossip Girl, as good as it gets, Trevor Pevlovar, Vax Wax, and what the hell is Ron Francis smoking? All right, we're going to go uh, put Brad down for a nap before he gets angry and kills someone. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.